praise be Jesus and Mary. St. Lawrence was born on July 22, 1559 in Brindisi, in the south of Italy, way down in the, in the, in the heel of the boot, uh, so to speak. His father died when he was a child. He went to a school that was run by conventual Franciscans and initially intended to enter their order. He was dressed in a little habit as a, as a child, as, as were the, the, like the, the other students who were basically minor seminarians. He was a brilliant student and did very well when he was allowed to preach short sermons. There was a custom there of having boys preach on a certain feast day as a kind of novelty, but our saint could actually preach well. When his mother also died, St. Lawrence moved to Venice where he had an uncle who was a priest and ran a school. There he met the Capuchins and decided to enter their order instead. But his poor health was an obstacle. and. He, but by praying to Our Lady, he was able to become well enough in order to, to be accepted. He had a prodigious memory. Already in the novitiate, he was able to, to indicate the chapter and, and verse of any passage his companions could quote him from the Vulgate, the Latin version of the Bible. He was ordained a priest in 1582, but his preaching talents were so outstanding that he was assigned to preach for Lent in a church of, in Venice when he was still a deacon. He's called the Apostolic Doctor because he worked mainly as a preacher. He preached for Lent in many cities of Italy, and in Germany he, he defended the Catholic faith against the Protestants in his sermons. His, his uh, surviving sermons, really his, his notes, the, what he used to prepare his sermons, fill 12 volumes in English translation, and there's much more that was lost. He was even assigned by the pro Pope to preach to the Jews. Of course, no one likes being told that he's wrong, but St. Lawrence did it with such charity and erudition that they liked him more than any other preacher. Preachers were to address the Jews in, in Hebrew if they could, and by a special grace from Our Lady, St. Lawrence did this so well that the, the rabbis thought that he must have been born a Jew and then converted. He also cited rabbinic texts to argue that for the truth of the Catholic faith. Besides his work as a preacher, St. Lawrence also occupied various positions of responsibility in the Capuchin Order. He was the provincial superior first in Tuscany and then in the Republic of Venice. He served as a counselor and assistant to the general superior of the Capuchins. In 1598, he was elected provincial superior for Switzerland, a relatively new province with growing pains. In order to carry out his duties properly, he went to study German, and this prepared him for his next mission. The following year, he was chosen to head a group of Capuchins that would expand the order into Austria, Germany, and Bohemia. There, the Capuchins were needed to save the faith of Catholics and to refute Protestants, both by their holiness of life and by their words. They worked alongside the Jesuits, the other outstanding missionaries in those lands. He founded priories, strengthened the faith of Catholics, and reconciled many Protestants to the Church as an ambassador for Christ. In 1601, he served as chaplain, or head chaplain, for the imperial troops that defeated the Turks at Alba Regia in Hungary. His courage on the battlefield and the miracles that he worked made him famous throughout the courts of Europe. As the Turks were loading their cannons, he would trace a large sign of the cross in the air with his crucifix full of relics. The cannons would fire, but the balls did no damage. In 1602, the Capuchins held a general chapter and elected St. Lawrence Superior General almost unanimously. It was his duty to visit all the Capuchin provinces scattered at that time throughout the peninsula of Italy, the Holy Roman Empire, France, and Spain. The last time any Capuchin General Superior had succeeded in visiting all all the provinces was decades before, when the order had not yet expanded much outside Italy. It was a prodigious march through Europe, lasting almost the whole of his three-year term. He would walk 20 or 30 miles a day, or even more. Some of his travel was through regions that were mostly Protestant, where Catholic churches were few and far between. One time it was the, the vigil of St. Lawrence the Martyr, his patron. He and his companions walked 20 miles before noon in order to get to a church to be able to say Mass. 
The strict Eucharistic fast of that time didn't even allow for water, so at least our saint hadn't eaten or drunk anything since midnight. At lunch they learned that the next Catholic church was 40 miles away, and so they, they set off immediately, walking another 20 miles that day while keeping the fast required by the Friday and the vigil. When they woke up in the morning, they went the remaining 20 miles, still without having anything to eat or drink, so that they could receive communion at, at Mass. This shows how important the Mass was to them. It was something, uh, really, that they considered indispensable. If there was, a, even at the, the cost of, of great sacrifice, they would make sure they got to Mass every day. After his term, St. Lawrence returned to the Capuchin Mission, headquartered in Prague, the capital of the Holy Roman Empire. His preaching was attended by members of the court and ambassadors, many of whom wanted his advice about policy questions. When he celebrated Mass in private, he would take his time and experience ecstasies. His private Masses got longer and longer. They began to take hours. The emperor was, was weak, probably mentally ill, and the Protestants bullied him and other authorities into making ever more concessions, even as the Protestants failed to recognize the rights of Catholics. So they wanted rights for themselves, but not for others. Priests were being killed, processions attacked, and the territory of Catholic princes invaded and occupied. A Catholic League was needed for self-defense, and St. Lawrence was sent as its ambassador to Madrid and Rome to secure financial support for its army. After he succeeded in this mission, he returned to Prague. A few years later, when the emperor died, he went back to Italy. God gave him power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, as the St. Luke says of the Apostles. Wherever he went in Italy, he was mobbed, and he cured innumerable sick and cast out countless demons. Somehow crowds would always show up, even when he arrived unannounced and secretly. Whatever time he could get away from the crowds, he spent in deep prayer, like our Lord. Our Lord was mobbed by crowds during the day and spent his nights in prayer. St. Lawrence would get up at midnight, pray the divine office, and then say Mass, typically finishing eight to ten hours later. In 1618, he was hoping to finally get back to Brindisi, where he hadn't been for 13 years, but he was forced to change uh, his itinerary and stop in Naples. The, the citizens of the, the Kingdom of Naples were suffering terribly from the bad rule of the Spanish viceroy, the Duke of Asuna. And the Neapolitan nobility appointed St. Lawrence their ambassador to Philip III, the King of, of Spain. When he tried to refuse, they presented him with a written order from the Pope, so there was nothing to do. He had to set off. The Duke of Osuna sent assassins after him to stop him from getting to Madrid, but on May 25, 1619, having avoided those assassins and other obstacles, St. Lawrence reached the, the, the King in, in Lisbon. But when negotiations seemed to be going well, uh, finally, he, he fell ill, probably due to, to poisoning. A month later, he died on his 60th birthday, July 22, 1619. In the last century, scholars finally managed to, to decode his personal system of abbreviations so that they could publish his works. This made his teaching known and led to him being named a doctor of the church in 1959. He is especially notable for the first volume of his works, which collects his sermons on, on Our Lady. He illustrates Mary's privileges extensively from Scripture, including doctrines that would only be defined later, like the, the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption. Praise be Jesus and Mary. If you'd like to grow in love and knowledge of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, consider a subscription to the Missio Immaculate magazine. The Missio is a bi-monthly magazine published by the Franciscans of the Immaculate for over 15 years. Every issue of the Missio features articles about Our Lady's privileges and her mission in the church and world for the sanctification and conversion of souls. The Missio takes to heart the ancient saying of the church, De Maria Numcom Satis, of Mary you can never say enough. You can subscribe online at missiomagazine.com, that's M-I-S-S-I-O, magazine.com, or go to the homepage of, the, of airmaria.com. Back issues of the Missio are also available upon request. The Missio is a practical way to behold your mother and take her into your home. Ave Maria.